Okay, I think we will begin. Hello, everybody, and happy World Water Day. Welcome to Global Water Futures virtual celebration of this important day. We're very excited to share it with you from wherever you are today. While we're streaming live from Canmar, Alberta, from the Global Water Futures Cold Water Laboratory, we have speakers today from Calgary, Winnipeg, France, and Sweden, and many participants coming in from all over the world. My name is Stephanie Merrill, and I'm a Knowledge Mobilization Specialist with the Global Water Futures Program, and I'm based at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, for a few of you who may uh, be new to Global Water Futures work, I'll give you a quick introduction. Global Water Futures is the world's largest university-led water research program. It's a partnership between the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Waterloo, McMaster, and Wilfrid Laurier University. We're at the halfway mark of a seven-year program to advance the science needed to better forecast, prepare for, and manage water futures in the face of dramatically increasing risks from climate change. Working with water practitioners, governments, industries, civil society, and Indigenous communities guides us and enables us to better connect our science and evidence to the water programs, decisions, and policy developments. Today, you will hear advancements in the program, particularly from the Cold Water Laboratory, from the Canadian Rockies, and how this is scaling up over Western Canada and other cold region, regions around the world. Before I turn it over to our moderator, who will lead us through a 90 minutes of presentations, videos, and discussion, focusing on valuing water, particularly mountain water, which is the theme of this year's, this year's World Water Day. I'll quickly attend to a few housekeeping items. You are able to listen today in both English and French by clicking the interpretation icon in the toolbar. Closed captioning is also available in English and also found in the toolbar. We are recording in both languages and we will share those recordings after the event. Please use the dedicated Q&A function of the Zoom platform to submit, submit your questions throughout the webinar. And we will draw on these to pose to today's guests. With those out of the way, I'd like to introduce to you Robert Sanford, our moderator for today's event. Bob Sanford holds the Global Water Futures Chair in Water and Climate Security at the United Nations University Institute for Envi Water, Environment and Health. Bob is an accomplished writer and policy advisor and is committed to translating scientific research and outcomes into language decision makers can use to craft timely and meaningful public policy and to bringing them into um, opportunities for change. Bob, I would like to ask you to come on and uh, begin today's discussion. Yes, can you hear me, uh, Stephanie? I can hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you again for all you have done to make this webinar possible on this special day. And in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, I wish to acknowledge from the outset that all peoples contribute to the diversity and richness of civilizations and cultures, which constitute the common heritage of humankind. And it's to that common heritage of all of humanity that I wish to direct my remarks today and dedicate our World Water Day. More specifically, please allow me to acknowledge that I'm offering this presentation from my home in the front ranges of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Our mountain waters flow from the ancestral territories of Treaty 7 nations of Southern Alberta, which include the peoples of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Kainai, Pekani and Sutina, as well as the peoples of the Nakoda nations and Métis. And in addition to living in the midst of these spectacular ancestral territories, we're lucky to live in a remarkable community, a community that is on the threshold of choosing a new identity. And we hope that that identity can be positively informed, not just by ecological understanding, but by all the earth sciences, and especially by our growing understanding of water and climate 
and their effects on the function of the self-regulating Earth system that makes life possible, not just here in these extraordinary mountains, but elsewhere on the surface of the planet and in our oceans. And in our efforts to establish that identity, we have been extremely fortunate to have the town of Canmore behind us. Most importantly, we have the unflagging encouragement of the mayor of Canmore, without whose support scientific research would not have the present it does in this community today. Our mayor has been a champion of the role of scientific knowledge in defining pathways to sustainability and climate action. And he's also helped us immensely in establishing our global center here. I'm absolutely honored today to introduce his worship, the mayor of Canmore, John Borman. Please, John. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, in the words of our Stony and Nakota First Nation neighbors, Amba was ditch. Welcome to all. It really is an honor to be invited to celebrate World Water Day and World Water Week with all who are taking part in this global webinar. I'd like to extend a warm virtual welcome to all of you on this third day of spring in our Canadian Rockies and wish you a happy World Water Day. In his introduction, Bob mentioned our community's ongoing support for scientific research. I will note that I had gained an appreciation for the importance of our mountain water some time ago as well as a keen interest in Canmore's potential to be a recognized center for scientific research. I even had a tenuous connection with the University of Saskatchewan long before I was elected mayor. Some of you will remember Dr. Ron Perla, a snow physicist who worked with the National Hydrology Research Center located at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Dr. Perla spent many years here in the 1980s studying snow physics, especially as they relate to avalanche. And for 30 years, my wife and I were next door neighbors with Ron and his wife, Gretchen. And of course, we came to know them as our friends. And I'm pleased to report that Ron and Gretchen are retired now and doing very well. In his introduction, Bob also mentioned that Canmore is in the midst of reimagining uh, the future of our growing community. As with so many other communities, large and small, we wrestle with the issues of growth, climate change, and sustainability. These challenges require our residents and our visitors to reconsider what defines a sustainable mountain town in the Canadian Rockies. In Canmore, we are actively considering our future. Our town is changing, and it is now clear that in addition to being a center of tourism, we're also becoming an intellectual center of excellence. Canmore is not only a destination for mountain enjoyment and appreciation, it is also a place that attracts high caliber thinkers in a broad range of technical and intellectual domains. The transition that we are experiencing is this, well-educated, respected intellectuals and professionals hear about Canmore and come to visit. Many like it so much that they become weekenders or part-time residents. And the next step is often that they then become permanent residents or retire here and become full-time contributing citizens. We've had a foretaste of just how attractive Canmore uh, could become as an intellectual center when Dr. Pomeroy and the University of Saskatchewan made our town a hub for research and understanding of the hydrology that makes the Mountain West so unique a place to live and visit and a world center for research on mountain water and the global climate. We recognize that a tremendous opportunity is before us now to build on the intellectual capital that we have already attracted to this community and to create a culture commensurate with the remarkable nature of the landscapes that surround us. As the Global Water Futures Program transitions, transitions into global water solutions, we are looking forward to a long-term 
permanent university research presence in Canmore. And to add to that, I understand that the government of Canada is about to create a new Canada Water Agency. We urge that agency to build upon the outstanding work being done here in the headwaters of the great rivers of the West by, by co-locating its research here in this valley where we already clearly understand and celebrate the value of mountain water. Now let this celebration begin. Happy World Water Day to all, wherever you are in the world. And thank you. Thank you, Mayor Borman, greatly appreciated. And we certainly appreciate your support. It's my pleasure now to introduce a member of parliament from Manitoba who has done what Mayor Borman has done for us here in Canmore, but for water and water science and governance on a national scale. Not only does this MP have decades deep understanding of water issues in Canada and abroad, he is also a very effective politician who knows and understands the federal system. Just as importantly, he has diplomatic skills and connections to make positive change happen within that system. And proof of that resides in the fact that water is now, at last, one of the top priorities of the federal government. Because of his experience, knowledge, and skills, and the trust the Prime Minister and the Cabinet have in him, Terry Duguid was appointed Parliament Se Parliamentary Secretary, responsible, among many other things, for the creation of the Canada Water Agency, something Canada needs in order to better respond to 21st century water-related circumstances. This man is extraordinarily busy and we are most lucky to have him on this webinar. Please allow me to introduce Terry Duguid, Parliamentary Secretary, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Bob, and, th and thanks for that uh, overly generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and may I um, just repay the, the compliment, uh, like water, you are a, a precious natural uh, resource uh, that, uh, uh, and you have been such a, an advocate, uh, a very, very knowledgeable one for uh, advancing our country's uh, progress on, on, uh, on water management and, and protection. So thanks for all you do and for emceeing our event uh, uh, today on World Water Day. And, and a shout out to Mayor uh, Borrowman after hearing his very enticing words. Uh, I uh, wanted to jump on a plane and, and uh, head out to uh, Canmore, one of the most beautiful uh, places uh, on, on earth, uh, the gateway to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, I hope to visit him uh, soon when our public health officials uh, say uh, it's, it's okay. And, uh, uh, but folks, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. And uh, I'm really delighted to join you from Treaty One Territory. Uh, the homeland of the Métis Nation uh, here in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, Canada, where it's a, a balmy 10 degrees after a pretty long uh, and difficult uh, winter. And, and let me start by wishing everyone uh, on the call today, on, 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 the, um, on the forum today, a very happy World Water Day. And uh, as we uh, continue to live in challenging times, uh, uh, many of us individually and collectively recognize that the pandemic has been a pivotal period in our history. We're seeing a, an opportunity of will and collective desire to come out of this pandemic better and to uh, recover in a way that accelerates our ambition for a sustainable world. And today I'm uh, happy to celebrate uh, World Water Day with you uh, with this year's theme, Valuing Water, which raises awareness about the importance of water to global well-being. And uh, I, as I don't need to tell uh, the folks uh, on uh, our, uh, in our forum today, water is one of the 17 commitments we made uh, as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In all parts of the world, uh, climate change is posing uh, significant issues for the sustainability and availability of fresh water from from droughts to floods to deteriorating water quality, freshwater challenges are intensifying. As a government, uh, we continue to take uh, seriously climate action. And just this past December, we renewed our commitment through the strengthened climate plan. Conserving nature and protecting our water is an important pillar of our mandate and that plan. When we talk about uh, valuing water, it's our recognition that a safe freshwater supply is essential to the well-being of our people, our health, our economy, 
in Canada, we are, are so blessed. We are a water rich country, but accessible and reliable fresh water is sometimes limited and systemic inequality issues remain. We recognize the, the significant challenges First Nations communities face, and the Government of Canada has recommitted to end long-term drinking water advisories on reserves through additional investments. The vast uh, nature of our landscape uh, uh, further contributes to the complexities of freshwater management in Canada. Challenges uh, vary by region, and addressing them can involve multiple jurisdictions, and that requires a collaborative approach. And that's why the Government of Canada is moving ahead with the creation of the Canada Water Agency. A Canada Water Agency presents an incredible opportunity for greater collaboration in Canada to protect and manage our freshwater resources sustainably. The, Canada, the Government of Canada is not embarking on legislative or regulatory changes by establishing the Canada Water Agency. The intent of the agency is to work collaboratively, and I underline that word, collaboratively with other governments and respect the jurisdictions of those governments. We also know that this is another avenue of opportunity for constructive dialogue between the federal government and Indigenous peoples on freshwater issues. We recognize the leadership and inherent connections Indigenous peoples have with water. Indigenous knowledge systems can play an important role in freshwater decision making. And the Government of Canada is committed to working collaboratively with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in the creation of the Canada Water Agency to keep our water safe, clean, and well-managed. We've just completed our uh, consultations on our discussion paper towards the creation of a Canada Water Agency, uh, meeting with many, many organizations and stakeholders, including with provinces and territories, and we are continuing our ongoing engagement with national Indigenous representatives, modern treaty partners, and self-governing Indigenous nations. When it comes to the potential role of the Canada Water Agency, we've heard many perspectives and views. And I very much uh, want to thank all of you who have participated in our consultations. I particularly want to thank, uh, of course, our, our MC, uh, Bob Sanford, uh, John Pomeroy, uh, Stephanie Merrill, and all the good folks at uh, Global Water Futures for their leadership on water research, uh, their support of moving forward on a Canada Water Agency, and for their sponsorship of today's event. Everyone joining uh, today is helping us uh, build a stronger, more sustainable economy and a brighter future for this and future generations. I'm looking forward to the discussions and the recommendations that will result from our consultations and from this forum. Just in uh, conclusion uh, today, on World Water Day, we have a timely opportunity to reflect on what water means to us. In uh, considering the different ways uh, water benefits our lives, we can better understand its value and how best to take care of it. And by doing that, I'm very, very optimistic for a better water future for all Canadians and all the world. Uh, thank you and back to you, Bob. Thank you very much, Parliamentary Secretary. We're grateful you were able to make time to help us celebrate World Water Day. And thank you again for all you do. Now, like Parliamentary Secretary Duguid, the, the next speaker is widely known here in Canada and the broader water science community. And it's fair to say that Dr. John Pomeroy knows as much about mountain water as anyone, not just in this country, but certainly around the world. His credentials, achievements, and the recognitions he has received for his work are simply too numerous to list here now. Suffice it to say that uh, Dr. John Pomeroy is the architect and director of Global Water Futures, which as Stephanie reported is the largest university led water and water related research initiative in the world. Dr. Pomeroy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bob. And uh, I, I wish to uh, thank uh, your worship, Mayor, Borman and uh, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Terry Duguid is Parliamentary Secretary for the Canada Water Agency, for your incredibly encouraging and supportive remarks in your leadership on this issue. The, uh, uh, the Canada Water Agency is the way that Canada will celebrate World Water Day every, 
every day, every year, uh, through its acts and through its good works that it will uh, do around the world. And so um, I, I'm so delighted uh, that uh, th there is your support and your vision to bring this forward. And uh, from Canmore and from the world, uh, we want to uh, contribute as best we can uh, to making Canada a safer and more prosperous and environmentally conserved part of the world and to look after our one fifth of the world's fr global fresh water in the right way and provide a model internationally. Um, I'm going to uh, show a, a few slides here and uh, introduce uh, some things and make a few remarks. And so uh, bear with me as I start that up and uh, get our speakers going. Um, so here we are. So hopefully you can see this. All right. And um, so the uh, in terms of World Water Day from Canmore, uh, let's move on to a couple of things. A World Water Day and valuing water is about valuing people and water as well. And the first thing I, I, I wish to uh, say with uh, great sadness, we have lost uh, two very great people in the uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, one is Dr. Adam Winstrow, a uh, mountain snow and water and climate scientist uh, who has worked with us in Alberta and Canada for many years. There's a picture of him there in uh, Yukon at Wolf Creek. And of course, uh, he, he was working at that time with the US Department of Agriculture in Boise, Idaho as part of an uh, international collaboration. He's more recently been with the uh, Swiss Snow Institute in Davos, Switzerland, and a close uh, collaborator and one who made great strides in assimilating snow information data into predicting floods and, and water supply in the mountains. So uh, we just lost Adam a few days ago and uh, uh, losing a great uh, friend there. Uh, we've also lost uh, uh, who is someone, David Schindler, is perhaps and almost certainly Canada's greatest water scientist ever. Uh, winner of the Stockholm International Water Prize, uh, the man whose research uh, saved the lakes of northern Canada by showing the impacts of eutrophication and acidification from acid rain, and the, uh, this led to the Acid Rain Treaty, but then more recently worked in Alberta, including in the mountains, uh, bringing forward the problems that we had in the Athabasca River in the north, but also contamination in the mountains and the perils of climate change on the uh, world's uh, mountain water supplies. And we lost David Schindler a few weeks ago. Uh, both great men and uh, decent people and be uh, greatly missed. So uh, move on from that sad note uh, to a happier note. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, region and to the world from the University of Saskatchewan's Cold Water Laboratory in Canmore, Alberta. Uh, we've been here for uh, since 2009. I guess that's 12 years now. That's not bad. It's a university presence in Canmore. We're here to advance science and understanding. And uh, we do that by making observations and testing sensor technologies. We model and predict hydrology and water at multiple scales. Uh, we focus on high mountain river basins, but we look at everything around the world, as you'll see today. Uh, we convene national and international science meetings and workshops in the region. We write papers, lots of them, hundreds, uh, and edit books and international journals, including the best in the world. We teach graduate courses in hydrology. Um, recently, 160 students took their classes from Canmore without visiting Canmore in the, in the greatest part or over, over the web. So uh, lots of teaching from here. And we lead the Global Water Futures Program, the largest freshwater research program in the world. It's actually led from Canmore, Alberta. So we also reach out to the world with global water solutions in this time of uncertainty, as Bob Sanford said. But um, enough from me, let's visit with the lab itself. And so here's a little video and uh, to show you more about that, uh, this wonderful group of people. Hi, my name is Cub. I'm Chilinji Chodri. I'm Caroline. I'm Major Alberto Sini. Hi, my name is Janine. Dave Casson. Abbas Fayada. Hello, I'm Danielle Nadeau. Squash Marisa Lagu. My name is Daniel. My name is Kieran Lehan. I'm Sherry Westbrook. I'm Louise Arnell. Greg Galloway. Logan Farm. And my name is Lindsay Lang. Selena Shutt. My name is Hans Okan. Paul Whitfield. I'm uh, Philip Harder. I'm a research associate with the Center for Hydrology. And I like to fly drones to measure snow. And my research focuses on trees and how they use water. My research focuses on hydrological modeling of Aral Sea Basin in Central Asia. I study the effects of forest vegetation on snowfall patterns. I study how mountain glaciers melt and how it's affecting water resources. 
I study the hydrology of cold regions with the help of field measurements and numerical models. Studying glacier modeling. And I study how plants modify weather and climate. My team and I study the eco-hydrology of wetlands, mostly in the Kananaskis and Banff region. I work on making better produce models that we can use to predict what happens to ourselves. To produce meteorological dead sets for lost America and all of the world. Is understanding the effect of climate change. I'm also an artist and I use my art to engage with a wider audience on the scientific topics. And I do research in civil defense to make groundwater peatland interactions through field-based methods. I'm a research technician with the Cold Water Research Laboratory. And I study snow data simulation. I use satellite data to improve our understanding of the hydrological processes. I'm currently based at the Cold Water Lab in Canmore, working on understanding snow process in high mountains using next generation models. And uh, this is my other office. Wow. So I'm smiling because. I haven't seen them for a year and uh, many of them, but that's just a sampling of some of the people who work out of the cold water lab from the uh, University of Saskatchewan. What a great, incredible crew we have. Um, the, uh, we're all here under the Global Water Futures Program, which aims to place Canada as a, a global leader in water science for cold regions and to address the strategic needs of the Canadian economy. Uh, the grand challenge that Global Water Futures has is how can we best prepare for and manage water futures in the face of dramatically increasing risks from a changing climate, developing economy, and changing society. And Global Water Futures has grown over the last few years to about 1,200 professors, researchers, students, and others is spread at 18 universities across Canada in 64 projects and core teams uh, working on these critical components of, of finding solutions for Canada and the world's water problems. So our mission is to improve disaster warning. And that was inspired very much by the disaster that uh, affected Canmore in late June, 2013. Uh, the start of the flood that's often known as the Calgary flood, our downstream neighbors were tremendously affected. It ended up being the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. And we want to improve disaster warning for events like that. We also want to look at the future, uh, the future water supply for Canada and the world, its quality, its management, its effect on the economy, its relationship to uh, society, to First Nations, to, uh, uh, to all Canadians. And then to inform uh, for our partners and water users how they might best adapt to changing water supply, how they can manage the risk in, a, in an equitable way under a dramatically changing water conditions. Uh, Canada moving from not just a country with uh, a vast quantities of fresh water, but a country with a water crisis of its own that if we can solve, we can provide a model for the world. In the mountain region, we have uh, many things that we uh, look at. One is integrated high mountain observations and prediction. This is something that has been picked up by the World Meteorological Organization as a way forward. And we uh, certainly showed how it can happen here with our observational stations like Marmot Creek from the 1960s, our use of airborne LIDAR back in 2007 to map out Rocky Mountain snowpack, use of high resolution wind models, use of remote sensing to look at things like the retreat of Pato Glacier or the modeling that I'll be talking to you about where we have now some of the most advanced snow models in the world world, which can give us the uh, snow blowing, the avalanching, everything else uh, that's so important for this region. Canadian Rockies Hydrological Observatory is uh, sometimes a sunny day place and sometimes we're up there under incredible winds and uh, wild, wild conditions as you can uh, see here. Uh, but we have 35 stations across the Rockies measuring snowpack, stream flow, uh, meteorology, uh, the, uh, all these things connected by telemetry and made available to the public. Something where we, it is a science gold mine in the mountains and we don't have to remove any snow to do it. The, um, from the uh, things like the LIDAR flights uh, from uh, UAVs, from, from drones, uh, we're able to develop these high resolution maps of vegetation and snow cover across the mountain region. Uh, we're able to uh, take research basins like Marmot Creek, which has a, a, a 60 year history now and, uh, and use that to advance our understanding and put that into our models. And then also uh, examine uh, some of the uh, many uh, problems that we have 
with uh, with these with the future of water supply, the loss of mountain snowpack in many areas by the end of this century, uh, uh, retreat by a month, uh, loss of 84 millimeters in water equivalent, um, which is uh, substantial in many parts of Marmot Creek. And then look at changes to the stream flow, the earlier stream flow, the warmer temperatures, the greater precipitation, and sometimes the greater peaks in stream flow that we'll see coming through. We've expanded these models up to the Bow River at Banff, as you see here, and looked at the much earlier stream flow coming for the Bow River by the end of the century, uh, some of the higher peaks and the lower lows uh, that are coming through that whole system. So uh, uh, lots of uh, predictions here, which are deeply disturbing. We've also been working on how to better predict uh, stream flow, and that means better predicting snowpack on the ground. And so this uh, model you see here is recently published by Vincent VNA, Chris Marsh and partners, and uh, is showing that we can now simulate the high mountain snowpack in a way that perhaps has never been done in the world in a scalable way. So we could do this for the whole Rockies and we are. And uh, we've got blowing snow, we've got avalanches, we've got mountain shading, we have variable winds, all this is built into this model. And we, as we uh, uh, show you here, it's necessary in order uh, to, uh, uh, develop uh, simulations that match what one can measure very carefully with things like airborne laser measurements. And if we don't include those in the models, we get this blue smear for the snowpack, which is very inaccurate. So we can uh, take that to feed into models such as uh, this one being developed with Environment Canada, uh, which can simulate the 2013 flood better than ever before. And yes, you are seeing Cougar Creek in there. It's part of the modeling simulation, as are some of the other small creeks, such as uh, 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 the one Smith Creek down in uh, the Three Sister development area. So ones that we have to keep an eye on, uh, very dangerous creeks, and uh, they are going to be included in the national flood forecasting system uh, because of our efforts here in Canmore. I guess the message is that we can affect transformative change from Canmore. And uh, we've shown that uh, with the visitors we've had, such as Greta Thunberg, we've shown that uh, by uh, leading initiatives for the World Meteorological Organization, a UN agency in Geneva uh, to align countries around the world with our approach. And we want to be a beacon to the world, uh, taking our values on mountain water and to use that to help the world in moving forward. Uh, so I'll wrap up there with that address. And I want to introduce the next speakers um, on Canadian perspectives. And uh, one is uh, Caroline Aubrey Wake. Caroline is a PhD student uh, based in Canmore, working on mountain glaciers. She put together that uh, video and assembled it. She has many, many talents, as well as uh, st strong field skills and modeling skills. And uh, Professor Al Pietronero, uh, Dr. Pietronero is the, <coughs> excuse me, is the uh, uh, research chair in uh, water resource uh, systems and climate uh, change at the University of Calgary and was recently uh, the executive director of the National Hydrological Service for Environment Canada. He co-leads uh, the modeling program at uh, Global Water Futures. So I hand it over to you two and thank you so much and we'll keep this show moving along. Great, thank you, John. Um, I will share my screen to present some slides here. Um, so you should be seeing my screen now. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the glaciers and how they are disappearing and how it's impacting water resources, specifically in Western Canada. Us living in Kenmore in the Bow Valley in Calgary, we get to see glaciers quite often. We go hiking, we go skiing, we see them. But it's important for us to realize that mountain water and glacier water has a wide ranging impact on a lot of people that are further away from us. And uh, these glaciers are retreating. So the pictures here I'm showing are just two pictures 100 years apart of the Athabasca Glacier, which is located uh, not too far from Kenmore, about two hours away. And really, the glacier has retreated tremendously. It has not only shrunk a little bit, it changed the landscape completely. There is now a road uh, and a parking lot in areas that 100 years ago there was ice. Um, and like all glaciers or most glaciers in the world, uh, they are disappearing, they are changing the landscape. But it is not only happening at this uh, long, slow time scale that these two pictures could, could hint at. Uh, glacier change can also be happening much faster than that. Um, so for example, at Pado Glacier, which is the main site for my research for my PhD, uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen the glacier retreat enough that now there's a pro-glacial lake at the toe of the glacier which makes access 
to the glacier much harder, uh, we might need to bring a boat next time to be able to access our, our field site. Um, but these changes, they're happening as we go year to year visit these sites. And even faster than that, um, they are happening um, year to year. So for example, here I'm just showing uh, two pictures that we got from a drone flying over Pedo Glacier um, from summer 2019 and summer 2020. And where the red arrows are, uh, we can see some very strong change. So we have some stink holes that open in the toe of the glacier. We have some caves that are opening on the side. And on top of that, the toe of the glacier also uh, melted by up to six meters uh, in that one summer. Um, so we don't really know how long the toe is going to last. It's collapsing. It's changing really, really fast. And we just kind of hope we're able to monitor these changes and study these changes uh, fast enough. Uh, however, um, also understanding these glaciers, like I said at the beginning, it's important not only because they're pretty and we like them and we want to go, be able to go ski on them, they also have really wide ranging impact for water resources, maybe uh, being able to go canoe on beautiful blue lakes in the Canadian Rockies or having water for agriculture in late summer in the prairies or uh, obtaining water in uh, cities downstream or even hydropower. So what happens with these glaciers is really important for a wide range of um, water use. But what happens in these, what happens in the rest of the world also affects these mountains. Uh, glaciers in the mountains don't live in isolation. They're not in a bubble up there far away from civilization. So for example, uh, what we've seen in the rest of the world in the last few years, uh, the increase in forest fires and in fires happening all across can have a pretty big impact on glaciers uh, through the impact of smoke. So when we have um, forest fires either in BC or in California, um, the smoke can travel all the way across to the Canadian Rockies. And uh, as I'm showing here on this picture, and the smoke can actually deposit on the glacier surface as little dark particles. And it makes the glacier surface darker, going from this shiny bluish gray to a much more dirty brown. And that impacts the melt and uh, it causes an increased melt in the, at the glacier surface and can accelerate the melt. And with this uh, melt that we're seeing all across um, the mountains in the Canadian Rockies, uh, we actually expect uh, I say we as the broader scientific community, not personally my work, but we expect the Western Canadian glaciers to uh, uh, almost disappear or up to 85% of Western Canadian glaciers are expected to disappear by the end of the century. And that's gonna not only fundamentally alter our landscape, it's also gonna have a large impact on our water resources. Um, so for example, just at Pedo Glacier, some of the work that we've done shows that uh, the retreat of the glacier could, re could result in a 53% decrease in summer flow. So we'll go from this black curve with a peak flow in, in late summer to a much reduced summer flow earlier in the year. Um, and that's going to have an impact on the streams that originate in these mountains for fish habitat, for recreation, um, and for a range of, of use downstream. So overall, um, I just want to emphasize the fact that glaciers are really important for a wide range of users, uh, not just for us living close to the mountain, uh, but also uh, for people living further downstream. And mountain glaciers are impacted by climate change in more than one way, not only because uh, they are melting, it's getting warmer, but also for from other processes such as forest fire activity. And these glacier retreat will have impact on uh, how our rivers behave um, and it's really important that we're able to study them and understand them to be able to predict the change and adapt to it. Um, and that was a short little highlight of glaciers. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to Al. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. And thanks for the introduction. So uh, hopefully folks can see my screen here. I will share it put it in the presentation mode. So thanks, uh, Caroline, for, for introducing the, the topic. And of course, all the water starts up in the glaciers and the high mountains. And um, where it goes after that is, is of tremendous importance to uh, all the stakeholders downstream. And so I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with respect to our core modeling. Um, 
So just to give you a, a bit of a, a breakdown here, this is this is the Saskatchewan River Basin, the north and the south. Um, we've done a, a mesh modeling study looking at uh, some of the impacts of climate change on, on this basin. Um, it starts in the headwaters of, of the Rocky Mountains, as everybody knows. And it really gets tricky with these basins because there's there's a lot of consumptive use with irrigation in, in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, there's also uh, municipal use, um, there's ecological needs. And so understanding the, this, this water buffer we have to play with ex with respect to climate change um, and some of the um, anthropogenic uh, human needs that are there um, is, is really a bit of a trade-off that we need to try to understand. So since about 2006, actually, we've been sort of looking at this problem with folks like Lawrence Martz and John, and others. Um, and so we're continuously improving our models to try to answer some of these pretty difficult questions. So the model, we, one of the models we use in, in our uh, Global Water Futures Program is, is the mesh modeling framework. It's um, a model that was uh, designed with Environment Canada um, and during my time there. And uh, it's it's been kind of the, the workhorse, if you like, of, of the, the large scale modeling efforts. So we're moving to a next generation of models as well. And I think Martin might be talking about that a bit later. But, um, essentially, it, it, it does a lot of uh, what we need in terms of understanding uh, future climates. Um, it's essentially uh, built on the RCM structure, actually the Regional Climate Modeling Structure from Environment and Climate Change Canada, but it adds a lot of hydrology, including things like uh, the prairies, it represents the mountains better, um, and also includes things like glaciers and permafrost. So it, it's, it's, if you think of it as a regional climate model, it's a regional climate model plus a lot of hydrology, which makes it quite applicable to, to what we're looking at. Um, so just quickly, you know, we've looked at some, some climate change scenarios coming out of the Canadian RCM model. We took 15 of those scenarios and run them um, from 1979, basically to 2100. Um, these show some of the results um, coming out of the model. Um, with the water management actually included. So we do include what we know about the irrigation systems in Alberta and, and uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a bias corrected version of the RCM. And that we do include uh, glaciers in, in the model, but they're, they're fixed. And so there's a few things we still have to work on the model, but this, this gives an index or an idea of kind of what's happening. So you're seeing that the slight shift to earlier peak flows um, as we move on with time um, and, um, and a slight reduction of peak, but an overall change and increase in volume in, in a lot of the basins. And so when you break it down into numbers, uh, these are the kinds of numbers we can come up with on the system. So you, you look towards the 2070 time period, you're seeing likely on an average annual basis, a 15% increase in, uh, in flows actually on the Old Man, Old Man River near the mouth. Part of that is likely incorrect um, because we haven't adjusted the glacier areas. And as Carolyn uh, aptly pointed out earlier, the glaciers are receding. And so we need to incorporate a dynamic element into the model dealing with glaciers, which we're working on currently. Um, uh, and, uh, and a few other fixes in the model with respect to water use and water consumption. But, but this, is, um, this is what we've come up with so far. And uh, we plan on moving this forward and, and finalizing results very shortly. Just a quick summary, um, based on what we came out of the bias corrected GCM runs, um, uh, we're seeing increase in mean annual flows in the 27 period, and that's pretty consistent with where we observed trends in the prairie uh, precipitation that we're seeing based on work done by Zubin Zhang recently. Um, of course, we've got to do more detailed modeling and look at different uh, downscaled RCMs, and we're going we're gonna to do that over the next little while, and we need to fix the glacier issue. So more analysis will be done by the JWF core team in the coming months uh, to further assess and advance these results. But it does give you a sense of what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. So with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Al. And uh, uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Louise Arnau, who is a flood forecaster with the Global Water Futures Program, came to us from the UK very recently, but more importantly in this context is the lead curator of the Virtual Water Gallery, uh, our response to art and science in a time of pandemic. Off to you, Louise. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for this introduction and uh, for having me speak here. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully you can see 
my presentation now. Um, so as John uh, introduced, I would like to talk a bit about art now and give an artistic perspective to all these wonderful talks that we've already heard. Um, so I'd like to talk about the virtual water gallery that has been started in the autumn of 2020. And I'd like to acknowledge as well the, my co-curators, Martin Clark, Stacey Dumanski, and John Pomeroy, who just introduced me. Um, so what this pilot project is, is um, it is a space for artists, water experts, knowledge keepers, and the public to co-explore water challenges. And so a key word in there is virtual. And we thought during these harder times of pandemic and social distancing, we've seen that so, uh, human connections um, and having access to cultural centers like galleries and museums is really important. And so we wanted to put a space in the virtual, uh, in the virtual world out there for everyone to connect through and for these human connections to flourish. Um, so taking part in this pilot project, we have 12 artists and 16 water experts and knowledge keepers. And on the right-hand side, you can see a nice mosaic of all the artists taking part either in the field or in other settings. So these artists, water experts and knowledge keepers are together co-exploring water challenges in various Canadian ecoregions and river basins. So that includes the Arctic, mountains, boreal forests, prairies, farmlands, lakes, rivers, and of course, the communities that inhabit these ecoregions. The gallery will also be showcasing four external science and art projects that uh, are wonder wonderful and have been going on already. Uh, and at the bottom right here, you can see our new visual identity and also behind me actually, uh, our new logo. And thank you to Fred Ryben for designing that uh, from the University of Saskatchewan. So these are sneak peeks of the wonderful artworks that have been co-created by artists in collaboration with the water experts and knowledge keepers. And you're the first people to see that. I'm really happy to share that with you today. Uh, so you can see a beautiful diversity in terms of the media used by the artists, as well as uh, the depictions, the, the different landscapes that are shown or different stories of behind these landscapes and water landscapes. And uh, I'd like to mention on the top left here, you can see Gennady Ivanov. And Gennady is also the artist in residence with Global Water Futures. And he's taking part as well in this uh, wonderful initiative, painting here the Peto Glacier that we've heard about from Caroline earlier. So, if you would like to see more from these uh, wonderful artists and water experts and knowledge keepers, we're launching very soon. And this is uh, the launch promotion. So I'd like uh, to let you know that we're launching on the 29th of April of this year. And you can now register uh, at this link below globalwaterfutures.ca. And Stephanie Merrill will also be sharing a link so that you can all go there um, if you want to register for this wonderful launch and join us to join some uh, to hear about the stories behind the creation of these pieces and the collaboration between the artists and the water experts and knowledge keepers. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to, if I may, uh, thank all of you for collectively demonstrating the depth of your knowledge of water in all its forms and your great appreciation of its value. For the last seven years, it has been my very great honor to offer a World Water Day address on behalf of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. This World Water Day will be an even greater honor to share this opportunity with Dr. Anil Mishra, who is a renowned expert on hydrology globally with UNESCO in Paris. And Martin, Dr. Martin Clark will introduce Anil as part of the next and last session on Canada's role with respect to global perspectives on water. This is the 28th anniversary of World Water Day. 
On this day of each year, the United Nations focused the attention of the world on the importance of water. And the theme for World Water Day this year is valuing water. We want everyone in the world to have what we have here, a reliable supply of clean, safe drinking water and the sanitation services that we take for granted. In this, valuing mountain water is critical as mountains are the source of water for billions of people globally. We want to also ensure that no country is left behind in improving its understanding of the importance of careful stewardship of water in rapidly changing planetary conditions. And this is not just about developing countries. No matter where you live in the world, the presence or absence of water is about to become a matter of serious concern. A global water crisis is imminent for many reasons. First of all, our population is growing and with it a demand for water increases. We need to grow more food, which demands ever greater amounts of water, as well as our industries and activities invariably rely on water, the supply of which is becoming less predictable because we've warmed our planet's atmosphere and accelerated the global water cycle. World Water Day is a day that the entire water community can take pride in and pride in what it does to make the world better. It's an opportunity to reflect on the value, not just of water, but the value of our work. The foundation of our work begins with science. It seems to me that the commandments of science can be reduced to two, to tell the truth and stand up for all humanity and for the planet now and generations into the future. Good science involves not just the sharing of knowledge about the world, it is a candle we light when we want to see and be warmed by the truth. But we know now that modern science is not the only way of knowing. Scientific knowledge alone will not be enough to get us through the bottleneck in which we presently find ourselves in the human journey. It will take all the knowledge and all the ways of knowing humanity possesses to get us through this dangerous moment in our history. More than at any other time in that history, we need to braid together all our ways of knowing and caring. We need to bring indigenous and local wisdom, as well as scientific knowledge to bear on the challenge of ensuring sustainable human presence on this planet, a presence that so very much depends on water. And that is why the work we all do has become so vitally important. In my view, the most immediate risk is that our society will lapse into some different but still functionally unaltered version of what we had before the pandemic, which would be a disaster leading only to the next disasters. Our interest should reside in not recreating the world we had, but rather in creating the world we want and the world we need to have if we are to perpetuate tolerable living conditions for ourselves and for the rest of the life on the planet in the future. And there is considerable urgency here. We need to change the direction we are going in time to ensure we never come this close to crossing the threshold of societal collapse again. In the context of properly valuing water, that means that we have to not just build back better, we have to build back bluer. There's opportunity in this. Through the creation of a Canada Water Agency, Canada can protect, proactively address the kinds of intensifying water challenges we know will demand new approaches to freshwater management for the rest of the century. Good models such as the European Union Framework Directive exist to guide us. In getting our house in order, we can provide knowledge, expertise, and processes for other parts of the world. Domestically and internationally, water is a powerful lever for achieving the sustainable development goals. On World Water Day, it's also important to draw attention to the role of water in equity and gender equity specifically around the world. Back in 2015, before the SDGs were officially agreed upon, Grin Schuster Wallace and I surveyed 10 countries to assess national capacities and needs. We found that Canada is home to water-related research capacity, expertise, technologies, and industries that are key to solving the water crisis and achieving sustainable water management in Canada, but which can also support the development of other nations. 
Canada can reinvent itself on the world stage by using what we know about treating and managing water as a vehicle for expanding trade, while at the same time use our expanding expertise in water governance as a means of fulfilling Canada's diplomatic and international development objectives. Through Water Canada has an opportunity to create the same kind of virtuous domestic virtuous circle domestically and internationally that we once established as a means of our reputation as global peacekeepers. On World Water Day, we also want the water community to know that we have revived the UN Decade of Action, Water for Sustainable Development in Canada. And you can find that information on this website. Stephanie, would you mind putting that up? Finally, uh, at the UN, we believe we need a new narrative, one that includes respect for the rest of life we share this planet with and whose presence we rely on for the stability of the Earth system that makes our presence even possible. And as part of that narrative, we need to create a new sense of time that extends forward to include future generations. World Water Day provides us with a forum in which everyone in the country can contribute to that new narrative about ourselves and our place in the sustainable world we want to create. World Water Day reminds us that we have to view development in a completely new light in order to gain even partial rain over accelerating hydroclimatic cycles, we have to list all the help nature can provide for us, which means restoring natural capacity. There is enormous power in realizing this, for it is at the local level where we live, we have the greatest power to do that, to affect change and to act most effectively in service of where and how we live and who we love now and in the future. In closing, please allow me to offer that we are at a crossroads. We need to get on top of this pandemic and get ahead of climate disruption before it gets ahead of us. We live in one of the places in the world where we can still do that. What Mountain Water tells us is that to create and have hope, we have to work together, all of us. In his landmark book, Horizon, Barry Lopez offered what we urgently need now is a second new and very different enlightenment and a, 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 a re-enlightenment of the enlightenment, if you will. But no enlightenment can proceed without a renaissance. We all of us need to be that renaissance, to be that new and wiser beginning. A better world is possible. To create that world now, we need to engage our clear-sighted, enthusiastic, informed, and courageous youth. We must invest in and unleash the energy and enthusiasm of the next generation. They are our hope for the future. This is a transformational moment, not just for those of us who care about water and climate, but for all of us who care about the future. Let us seize that moment. Thank you. And to continue, one of the most remarkable things about the Global Water Futures Cold Water Research Lab in Canmore is the caliber of scientists from all over the world it is attractive to live here while they conduct groundbreaking research into the dynamic interplay of snow, ice, mountain water and climate. Dr. Martin Clark is now a professor of hydrology at the University of Saskatchewan. He's the associate director of the Center for Hydrology and the Canmore Cold Water Laboratory and a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Clark is a world-class climate modeler who Dr. Pomeroy was able to attract here from the prestigious National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Over to you, Dr. Clark. Okay, um, thank, you, thank you, Bob. Um, it's been a delight to work with other scientists in the Global Water Futures Program to advance the science and practice of large domain hydrological modeling. We're celebrating World Water Day on the hydrological apex of the continent. The circuitous Columbia and the mighty Missouri supports the lives of our cousins in the south. The Fraser feeds our brothers and sisters on the left coast. The Athabasca and ultimately the Mackenzie supplies fresh water to the Arctic Ocean and the Saskatchewan snakes through the dry non-contributing areas of the prairies supporting the breadbasket of Canada. Our mountain water clearly has great value for the continent at large. In Canada, we're blessed by a bounty of scientific challenges. It's fascinating actually. 
So how does the non-homogeneous snow accumulation, blowing snow and avalanching affect the spatial variability of snow in the mountains? Um, John talked about this. How does the spatial variability of snow affect the magnitude, timing, and duration of snowmelt runoff? How is streamflow in the prairies affected by the fill and spill of topographic depressions? How does the temporal dynamics of non-contributing areas affect the water balance across the prairie provinces? What about lakes? Lakes are a ubiquitous feature of the Canadian landscape. What are the impacts of lakes and dampening streamflow? How do lakes affect stream temperature and fish habitat? And ecology, how does the dynamics of vegetation change, such as forest disease and wildfire, affect the partitioning of precipitation into evapotranspiration and runoff? Canadian hydrology is so much more interesting than the research in more temperate climes where the driving question has historically been, what happens to water when it rains? These scientific challenges are really forcing our hand um, towards computational cleverness. We've got a number of questions that, that we're struck with. How can we effectively merge information from multiple data sources to provide the best estimates of precipitation across poorly instrumented regions? How can we characterize the uncertainty in our precipitation estimates across the continent? How can we develop new geospatial intelligence to improve our model representations of the landscape? How can we capitalize on advances in applied mathematics to improve the efficiency and accuracy of our numerical models? How can we parallelize computations across hierarchical river networks to optimize the use of our supercomputing resources? How can we develop the next generation community of practice that enables us to effectively combine modeling advances from different development groups around the world? The animation in the bottom right shows the end result of our modeling capabilities. It shows simulations of stream flow and lake levels over the McKinsey River Basin. These modeling capabilities are used to simulate the terrestrial component of the hydrological cycle and earth system models for water security assessments and for flood forecasts. The capabilities that we're developing in Canada are being applied internationally. A new Global Water Futures project is the Planetary Water Prediction Initiative, which has two key aims. The first is to develop the computational infrastructure to support planetary prediction, and the second is to complete detailed case studies in cold regions. This global initiative provides an opportunity for Canada to develop multinational collaborations that leverage Canadian expertise in modeling cold regions hydrology and accelerate advances in planetary water prediction. I want to provide a couple of examples of, of, of the work that we're doing here. The first example shows our work to develop a global data set that quantifies uncertainties in spatial precipitation estimates. This is work um, by Go Chang Tang in our group. Each of the ensemble members in the animation is an equally plausible representation of reality. Um, the next um, example that I want to show illustrates some of the computational challenges that we have in global river routing. The figures show the computational speed up as we move to more and more processes, showing examples for the globe on the left and the Mississippi River Basin on the right. And the horizontal axis in the bottom plots shows the number of processes that are used for the computations and the vertical axis is the computational time. The straight lines in the global figure illustrate perfect scaling and the departures from the straight lines in the Mississippi show that the main stem is still a computational bottleneck. We're continuing to study these computational bottlenecks in some of our ongoing research. As we conclude and as we celebrate World Water Day together, we can take the opportunity to reflect on who we are and who we want to become. We can define our vision for the future. I'd like us to develop strong multinational collaborations that are focused not so much on developing a unified model, but more on advancing the science and practice of community hydrological modeling. We recognize that whilst different modeling groups have their own models and different groups need their own models, all modeling groups around the world share common computational challenges. I find personally that we currently spend more time talking than sharing. We go to conferences, we stand on the proverbial podium, we hold our model up high and we exclaim, look what I've created. We don't spend enough time, my friends, sharing computer code and modeling concepts across different model development groups. Sharing requires reconsidering our modeling approaches, developing computational capabilities 
that are model agnostic and figuring out how to implement new capabilities across different modeling platforms. If we rethink our modeling approaches through modeling standards by ensuring our computational capabilities are generally applicable, then we can thread a needle through the menagerie of models around the world and create hydrological modeling capabilities that are truly exceptional, capabilities that revolutionize the power of our predictions. Effectively sharing our computational capabilities can enable us to build and nurture a global community where we all feed off each other. Reorganizing our haphazard hydrological modeling approaches into, ex into an accepted community of practice can foster much greater sharing of our computational capabilities and enable us to be what we need to become. I'm excited about the future. I agree with my colleague, Bob Sanford, that we are indeed in the midst of a transformational moment. I'm delighted by the support of our local municipality, and I'm ecstatic about the formation of the Canada Water Agency. I look forward to my role in helping Canmore become the intellectual hub of global hydrological modeling. Looking forward. So we'll stop there. And as we're moving forward, I want to introduce um, Dr. Berit Arnheimer and um, Dr. Anil Milshra. So Dr. Berit Arnheimer is the head of hydrological research, Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute in Norrköping. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly, Berit, in Sweden. Yes. Here she's the coordinator of large European and international projects with a focus on strategic planning and communication. Berit's expertise is in hydrological modeling at local, regional, and global scales, hydrological predictions and forecasting, assessments of hydrological impacts from climate change, water management or water quality deterioration, and the development of climate services for the water sector. Barrett's also the president-elect of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. So Barrett, um, we'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a, a great introduction. And I will just, uh, I'm very honored to be here today. And as you can see on this picture, I'm actually also um, a fan of Canmore. I managed to visit just uh, before the pandemic, fortunately. So um, Science for Society, that was the title I was given. And this morning I woke up by a press release from WMO, that's the World Meteorological Organization. And it claimed that 60% of the WMO states, they have a decline in monitoring water resources. And only 50% of the states have quality assurance of water data. And only 40% of the countries worldwide have flood and drought early warning systems. And when you consider the, the sustainable development goals, we can all understand uh, that this is not leading the right direction the way it is now. They also claim that 129 countries, they don't have integrated water management and only 22 countries have transboundary cooperation. So I think as a scientific community, we actually have a lot to contribute to advance this situation. Uh, because what are the future of the water resources? This is something we need to figure out together. And right now we have the sixth assessment report from IPCC coming up. Uh, and I think this is a good way of the global community to actually work together and join forces in synthesis. Just like Martin tells us, I think this is also something we shouldn't leave to be done once every sixth year. This is something we should do continuously. We should work more closely together and collaborate between our research centers. Um, in this IPCC report, they will show us the global state and the predictions made by global climate models. They will also show the regional climate models, which are on much more detailed dynamic models. But there will also be a lot of interesting pieces on hydrological impact modeling. Uh, what we can predict about the future, what it will look like in a future climate. And when doing this uh, analysis, it's actually a huge work for us in the hydrological communities, because we need to consider different emission scenarios, 
different um, prospects of how the globe and the emissions of greenhouse gases, how it will evolve in the future. And then we need to consider a whole range of global climate models because they are all different and no model is perfect, just like Martin just told us. They all have their disadvantages and advantages. So you need to collect a huge ensemble of models and they are then transformed into regional climate models, which we also need to consider a range of those. And then they should always be bias adjusted because for a hydrological model, you normally need to have um, input data that resembles a bit as what you can monitor, because this is how our models are tuned and set up. So we need bias adjustment. And then we need the hydrological modeling to take place. So there is a huge production chain just to get the hydrological impact model uh, results in place. And in all these steps in this production chain, so to say, there are different uncertainties that we need to consider for the final result. And then we transform our time series from the hydrological models into different statistical variables and indicator indices and so on, on how to understand the changes that will take place. And we need to present it to some user, decision maker, policy maker in a way that they can understand and also including the uncertainties. So we have a huge challenge here in communicating also in the future. I think communication uh, is a major task um, in the future um, um, for future scientists. So we also have this uh, global um, river model or water model. Uh, it's called hydrological predictions for the environment, worldwide hype. Uh, and you can find these descriptions and results at hypeweb.smhi.se. So this is the modeling tool we use when we do this kind of um, huge um, uh, modeling exercises to see what the water resources will look like in the future. And we have different ways then to communicate and to deliver our data to different users. So to the right here, you can see a portal called climateinformation.org. This is one climate service where people can actually um, look at the results and they can have a very quick overview in site specific reports for specific sites. And they will also get uncertainty estimates here. Um, and, and that one is to the right panel, it's, it's a very easy access tool. To the left panel, we have the European uh, Copernicus climate change um, uh, service, um, climate service. And they have, there you can get access to a huge amount of data, but also to a toolbox where you can process the data yourself. You can use already defined scripts or make your own scripts, and you can use their computers to actually process the large amount of data that is available. But they also have demonstration projects. As, as you see here, Canada uh, actually took place and you were involved in one pilot project here, which was called Solutions to Water Threats in Canada. And there you can read about um, the work performed in Canada. Um, now I'm talking about global models and global data information. Uh, but uh, Barrett, Barrett, can you uh, have, have one more minute, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm very, okay. I, I will soon finish now. Okay. So for instance, how can you understand this data on the local scale? I, I'm taking one example here of a nation called Santa Lucia. It's in the Caribbean. It's, um, it's a, a, a country that is actually in between different grids. And in our global model, this is one sub basin. So, and it doesn't have any observations available on a global scale. But in fact, in reality, they have two uh, meteorological stations, they have five hydrological stations, and they have 52 catchments um, in their country. So then you need to actually tune this model. You can extract uh, a piece of the world 
and you can elaborate it on it locally and calibrate uh, this model and, and drive it with your own data and you will have a national model. So I think this is the future we need to share because as you mentioned before, uh, some countries are more advanced and we have a lot of knowledge also on the global scale, but we need training and we need sharing uh, to also help the more financially disadvantaged countries around the globe. And I think this is the way to actually solve uh, the problems for the future. We need to collaborate. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bera. That was fantastic, and we and we all appreciate your visit to Canmore. Um, it was maybe eighteen months ago. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was great. Um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Anil Mishra. Um, Anil Mishra is the Chief of Section of Hydrological Systems and Water Scarcity for the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program um, Division of Water Sciences at UNESCO in Paris. Here he's responsible for coordinating global activities related to hydrological processes, extremes, and climate change. Anil's experiences include numerous international scientific research studies, including education, capacity building, international technical co cooperation programs in the fields of hydrology, water resources, and adaptation policies in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, Arab regions, and in Europe. And now, thank you for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy World Water Day. Uh, as you know, and few, only a few hours ago, UNESCO, on behalf of UN Water, launched uh, this uh, World Water Development Report, which really highlighted and assesses the current status and the challenges uh, to the valuation of water across different sector and perspective. So this uh, report just launched a few hours ago is available from UNESCO website, uh, which UNESCO coordinates with all other UN agencies. So what is the uh, value of water? There are multiple values of water. And according to the report, valuing water uh, sources and ecosystem upon which they depend, primary valuation, Valuing water infrastructure for storage, use, reuse, and supply augmentation. Valuing water services, mainly for drinking water, sanitation, but also a human health aspect, and valuing water as an input to production and socioeconomic activity. And finally, sociocultural values of water, including recreational, cultural, and spiritual attributes. What are the challenges to identify values of water, including mountain value of water? And the fundamental uh, challenge is, uh, as previous speaker laid out, and also fantastic research uh, from the Canmore, from the uh, from Global Water Future Project, is knowledge, research, capacity development, but also dissemination, and also including uh, the data, how to capitalize a recent development from the Earth observation sensor network, including citizen uh, science, and and from social media. And it's very important also, John mentioned about it, uh, it's strategically important to recognize unique role of local and indigenous knowledge in addition to mainstream scientific and academic knowledge and to expand citizen science in order to collect, but also to validate the data to have a, a better valuation. So what are the takeaway messages from this UN World Water Development Report? Water has multiple values, Approaches to valuing water uh, vary widely across and within uh, different users' dimension and perspective, recognizing, measuring, and expressing water's multiple values and incorporating these into decision-making processes are fundamental to achieve sustainable and equitable water source management. And Berit also mentioned about sustainable development goal. Now, UNESCO's intergovernmental scientific hydrological program, which is serving member states for 55 years with the uh, war phase of IHP, which is basically uh, designed by member states uh, for water security. We are moving from eighth phase of IHP to ninth phase of IHP, science for a water secure world in a changing environment. And particularly UNESCO, as we stand for education, scientific, cultural organization, we promote really science, research and innovation and bridging data and knowledge gap and education. 
So I see there are lots of opportunity for possible uh, opportunity between proposed Canadian Water Agency and UNESCO. As parliamentary secretary highlighted the importance of, uh, of developing uh, water uh, Canada Water Agency, and already we are having discussion with the Global Water Future to develop a memorandum of understanding uh, between Water Future and UNESCO for setting international research agenda. As, as I said, UNESCO's international scientific mandate in which we could incorporate old water balance, hazard mapping of glacier, snow and permafrost, planetary modeling, water prediction, indigenous water issues, and co-creation of research, education capacity building, science policy discussion and outreach at the highest level. As highlighted by many uh, scientific uh, presentation uh, earlier today, I think there is opportunity to really uh, disseminate those scientific endeavors to the other parts of the world. And UNESCO is, uh, uh, UNESCO is encouraging Canada to work with UNESCO so that we can reach out to uh, different parts of the world. And some of the possible endeavor that was highlighted from snow modeling, glacier modeling, and I would also like to reflect that, you know, some of the figures that we are talking about world water balance comes from previous landmark studies done by UNESCO in 60s and 70s. And basically now the scenarios that Berit highlighted, the, the, the modeling scenarios that previous speaker highlighted, we need to really revisit those uh, those uh, old water balance, those figures, whether we have really, we still need to uh, see what are the uh, output at the, at the, um, from the large river system. So I think there are opportunities through UNESCO to revisit those landmark work. And in the 60s and 70s, UNESCO called for monitoring of snow and glacier. And we are still not, uh, we don't have the adequate monitoring system. So perhaps there is a time, and I would like to encourage also both uh, Global Water Future and Canada, proposed Canada Water Agency to, to work with UNESCO so that this information can be revisited and, and can be disseminated to outside world. Some of the example, if done appropriately, we recently developed Indian Glacier and Water Atlas through UNESCO's Flanders Trust Fund for support of UNESCO's activities in the field of science. Perhaps we could do similar work to identify uh, the, the, the work between UNESCO and Global Water Future. We are launching a project and we already have a cooperation with Global Water Future in the assessment of snow, glacier and water sources in Central Asia. So there are tremendous opportunity within the, through UNESCO's mandate for Global Water Future to help uh, other countries. And also uh, with, the, with the scientific capacities that Global Water Future processes, perhaps it can contribute to setting up international research agenda uh, by conducting uh, case studies on climate change and world heritage site, or maybe on the biosphere side, or propose like a UN International Year of Snow and Ice, which is actually already approved by ISP Council, but it has to be uh, approved by uh, United Nations General Assembly. So there are lots of opportunities uh, that we can really promote uh, high mountain hydrology, cryosphere, and water resources. And finally, uh, as, as highlighted by Parliament Secretary and also Mayor and also Bob, that it's very important to reach out to policy community and UNESCO stands ready to translate scientific findings into the policy. And also, as, uh, as Berit said, science communication and, and science for society. I think there is a lots of opportunity that Canada really uh, provide the knowledge base so that that can be translated into policy and it can reach out to both national, regional and international level. Thank you very much. Well, please allow me to thank all three of our distinguished speakers for their most interesting and thoughtful World Way Water Day uh, presentations. And I want to thank you, especially Dr. Mishra, for taking the time to join us from Paris and Dr. Harhami for joining us from Sweden. We're grateful for the relationship that we have with both UNESCO and the International Association of Hydrologic Sciences. Uh, John, do you have any comments? 
Yes, it, uh, uh, thank you so much. And the, the uh, discussion from Martin Barrett and Neil was uh, absolutely invaluable. It, it, it brings forward uh, several things that we need to do in Canada. We need to start looking externally and bearing our weight uh, as a major wealthy country with fantastic scientific expertise and uh, helping the world more than we have been. Uh, these, uh, uh, these atlases, uh, snow and ice and, and the, the water balance are decades out of date, uh, one done by a country that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Canada, as uh, one of the countries with the largest snow and ice reserves in the world, uh, by mapping global reserves, of course, we have to map our own, which we need to do very, very badly. We need to show greater leadership on water from the federal end uh, down through coordination with the provinces and with our uh, foreign external affairs and global affairs departments. And uh, uh, this is something that I think there is increasing will to do, and there's certainly the expertise to do it. Um, finally, um, I want to say that the, uh, uh, the uh, small group of researchers in Canmore stand ready to help. Um, we've been uh, trying to pioneer new devices to measure snow, to measure stream flow, to model stream flow, snowpack, glaciers. Uh, and uh, these, I believe, are something that can be exported around the world, something that can help UNESCO in its mission and help the uh, tremendous disadvantaged regions of the world uh, who do not share the water abundance that Canada does. The, uh, by finding our solutions internally, uh, we can show uh, the rest of the world and help the rest of the world uh, to make these uh, global water solutions. And that is something that we commit ourselves to here. And uh, you'll be hearing more at, at UNESCO from us. So uh, thank you, Anil. Before I pass it back to John, to John again for, for future events, just let me say that I think this has been a remarkable webinar. We have world-class science that's generating policy relevant, actionable outcomes. We have the capacity to create new institutions that will be able to address uh, new and emerging 21st century water and water related climate cha challenges. We're working together. We're in the midst of a transformational moment. We can seize that moment. We can move forward. John, back to you. Thank you, Bob. And uh, Bob, it's, uh, I just gonna say the last thing, you are the rock of water science in the Rockies. And uh, we couldn't do this without you. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, finally, a few things. Uh, you know, we've we've had uh, amazing announcements today. A strong announcement out of the province of Saskatchewan, hoping that the uh, Canada Water and offering for the Canada Water Agency to be based in Regina, Saskatchewan, and then also the interest out of Canmore that some of the predictions could be co-located here, much as they were when Dr. Ron Perla had his National Hydrology Research Institute Snow Lab on Main Street in Canmore. We can do that again. It was a good idea then, it's a good idea now. And uh, finally, a few events coming up, and one is the uh, Global Water Futures Annual Science Meeting, which is May 17th to 19th. It's an open science meeting, free to attend. It's going to be on the Zoom like this, uh, but uh, fantastic speakers and uh, uh, hundreds of posters and uh, a well-coordinated session uh, dealing with uh, Global Water Futures. So that may be one of the largest science meetings in uh, Canada this year dealing with water, and we invite you all to attend. And then finally, uh, when the pandemic is over, anyone who wants to come up to Canmore, we'll take you around to the sites and uh, happy to show you around uh, once our travel restrictions are all ended. Uh, we can't wait. So uh, thank you. Thank you all. Back to Stephanie. Thanks, Bob. Thank everybody for joining us today, all of our panelists and all of our attendees. Uh, I will be sharing the recording uh, of today's event with all of those who registered and please feel free to share that on with your networks. Um, and I just wanna end by again saying happy World Water Day. Uh, I hope that you take the opportunity what, with what's left of the day here in Canada at least uh, to find a local stream or, or lake. It's perhaps still frozen over, but uh, uh, find something to uh, reflect on uh, what water means to you today and I uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. Thanks and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye-bye.